Previously on Grace to You. The chief word in the Hebrew Old Testament is koshav, the shining, the blazing forth, the Shekinah. Christ is that koshav. At the second coming of Christ, everything goes dark. The shining Shekinah glory of God appears. He reveals himself in blazing glory. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Matthew opens the New Testament, of course, and uh, in his gospel he begins with the birth of the Son of God. Matthew wants us to know that this child who was born in Bethlehem is God's King, the anointed Messiah, the one who came to establish a spiritual kingdom and then a global kingdom and then an eternal kingdom. And so it's important that we look at the royal credentials of the child that is born. Matthew opens in the first chapter, the opening 17 verses, with the royal lineage of Jesus. He is from the family of David. His descendants go back to David. That is royal right, royal authority, royal heritage. In the Gospel of Luke, you have a genealogy of Mary, and of course Mary also is from the line of David, so through Mary He has royal blood. And through Joseph, he has royal right, royal privilege. He is born then as God's promised king, that David would have a son in the future who would be God's king is what the Old Testament promises. Christ fulfills that by His genealogy. We know He's a son of David. It is important for Matthew also to continue to point to the royalty of Christ by letting us know that the dominating kingmakers of the ancient world from the Middle East, known as Magi, come to crown this young king. They, they deliver to him the only coronation that he ever had. He had no coronation at the hands of the people to whom he belonged, the Jewish people. He had no coronation from those who ruled in Israel, the, the elite, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the scribes, the rabbis, the religious authorities. He had no coronation from any of his own nation, but he did have a coronation from the Gentile world from far away from the Middle East, and the Magi come to crown him king, to give him a fitting coronation as the newborn anointed one of God. Now just who are the Magi? Who are they? That is not a translatable word. It has come down to our time now, connected with magic and magician, things like that. But originally, Magi was the name of a tribe, and uh, they were a very astute tribe, a very advanced tribe in the ancient world. The highest level of education was really the law of the Magi. They had developed into the most elite, literate people in the Middle Eastern world. They even believed that there was going to come a Savior sometime in the world. They believed in demons. They believed in angels. So their tribe had been influenced by the Jews of the Old Testament somehow in the Middle East, and they had elements of Judaism and a lot in common with them. The Magi really were influenced because the Jews were taken captive into Babylon. The Babylonian captivity really culminated in 586 B.C. It reached its sort of completion. Uh, Jews were deported into Babylon. The Babylonians came, conquered Jerusalem, conquered the uh, southern kingdom of Judah, and hauled off the Jews to the Middle East, to the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, some of them returned, as we know, after seventy years, but many of them remained and intermarried. And uh, among those who were deported were prophets. Ezekiel went there, and particularly Daniel went there. Daniel rose to prominence in the Middle Eastern kingdom, and Daniel became, according to um, Daniel 5.11, the chief of the Magi, having been trained uh, in the law of the Medes and the Persians with his friends when they arrived there. He ascended because of his immense capability and skill. He was also a prophet of God. And so he exposed particularly the Magi 
to the truth about the coming great King Messiah. He wrote a lot about Messiah in his prophecy, including the time that Messiah would come, even details that in chapter 9, something of the character of Messiah, something of the accomplishments of Messiah. Daniel laid that all out. Daniel also was familiar with the rest of the Old Testament and the other prophets and would have been used by God to teach them a lot. They taught him the law of the Medes and the Persians. He taught the Magi the Old Testament. Some of them came then to believe in the true God and to believe in His promise of a coming King. That's the backstory behind where we are in Matthew chapter 2. They are the official kingmakers of the East. Nobody is appointed a king in those Middle Eastern massive empires unless they are affirmed by the Magi. They are the ones given the authority because of their high level of elite status. They are like the Senate or the Supreme Court rolled into one, and it is their responsibility to identify kings. No one reigns without their approval. They have recently deposed the reigning king in the Middle East just before the birth of Christ. They are looking for a new king. The problem is this, there is already a king in Israel, and it is Herod. Herod the Great, he called himself, not a modest man by any means. He calls himself Herod the Great. He had been given that title even though he was not a Jew. He was an Edomite or an Idumean. Uh, he had been literally put in that position by Rome. Rome basically ruled the world at that time in the West, and whenever they occupied a country, they, they put leaders in and rulers in that represented Roman power. So Rome is in power, but they need someone to represent them. They found that someone in this man, Herod the Great. He represents Rome. He is kind of a... Um, he's kind of an acceptable person because he's a Middle Easterner even though he's an Edomite. He's not a Roman. And uh, he found some acceptance among the Jews, at least for a while. The early part of his career demonstrated a, a large measure of success in the things that he was able to do from a leadership standpoint. The latter part of his career was an outright total disaster, as we'll see in a moment. But think about these um, magi who come to worship Him. They have nothing to guide them but the testimony of the Jews that they have met in the captivity. They have some knowledge of the Old Testament. They are skilled scientists, but their science is mixed with some superstition, so they're into both astronomy and astrology. They are enthusiastically engaging in a long, long journey uh, from the Middle East because they are convinced that God is the true God, the Old Testament is the true book, and this could be the true King. So that is the scene as we come to verse 3 where we pick up the text again. We go from the arrival to the immediate agitation. I told you last time, this is not three men with three gifts and three camels. The entourage itself would have numbered in the thousands because they were so important, they are on such a long journey, they would have been accompanied by animals and animal keepers and servants and all kinds of cooks and the soldiers who would have gone along with them to make sure they were safe. This would have been a very, very huge entourage that showed up in Jerusalem. And when they get there, they ask the question, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And you might expect at that moment that Herod would stick his hand in the air and say, I'm right over here. I'm the king of the Jews. The Romans gave me that title. I deserve that title. I managed to bring about a measure of peace in this place, and um, I have been honored by having that title. That is why Herod was troubled. He was troubled. It means to be agitated, to be shaken. It is translated in Matthew 14, 26, the very same word, afraid. He is terrified at what's happening. He would have had some normal fear of, um, of the entourage itself, of the power of the Middle Easterners. They were a kind of mysterious people. Um, they, there were legends about them that made them even appear more fearful than they were. They no doubt are armed, and they are very large. He is frightened of them. But more than that, he is frightened because they are saying there is another king of the Jews, which means it's not him. 
He is asked the question, where is he who has been born King of the Jews? The assumption of the question is that Herod would certainly know and be thrilled because the King of the Jews was the one long promised by the prophets. I don't think the Magi thought they were a threat to him. I thought they might have assumed, I think they might have assumed that he would say, oh, well, of course I know, here's exactly where he is. But that was not the case. This is a man who is in panic, and when he gets panicked, lots of people die. And that's why Jerusalem is troubled. The great city with its magnificent religious institutions, wonderful, unparalleled Herodian temple overlaid with gold still in the process of being built, the city with its aristocratic priesthood, its benevolent institutions. The city with the Scripture had absolutely not only no knowledge of the king that had been born, but no interest in the king that had been born. They were self-satisfied. They were rejectors from the get-go, from the beginning to the end. This story really foreshadows the whole story of their rejection of their king, the Lord from heaven. There was not room for Him in the inn. There was not room for Him in the temple. There was not room for Him in their hearts. They were worried not about the new king. They were worried about the old one. Jerusalem knew when Herod's afraid, rebellion, bloodshed, and suffering is inevitable. Well, Herod's agitation, verse 4, leads to this. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. He um, knew about the Messiah. Every Jew celebrated the coming of Messiah. Messiah was on the harps, hearts and lips of many. He knew the ultimate King of the Jews would be the Messianic King that God would send. He knew King of the Jews and Messiah in the final sense were one and the same. He's not going to kill the Magi. They're too much of a threat to Him and there's massive power behind them, if not in His presence at the very time. He's not going to start a war that He can't win. But He also knows He's got to find the King and kill Him. It's a whole lot easier to kill one child than to fight the Middle Eastern armies. So he hatches his plot and he calls together the theologians and the religious leaders, those who were the scribes, the experts in the Old Testament, the law and the Scripture, the chief priests. That, that, are, that group is the priestly aristocracy that ran the religion. And he calls them in and he says, where is Messiah to be born? which again demonstrates that he's not Jewish and he's ignorant of Scripture because every Jew knew the answer to that question, every Jew. How did every Jew know where Messiah was to be born? Because in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the prophet said he would be born in Bethlehem. Everybody knew that he was to be born in Bethlehem. The Old Testament says he'll be born in Bethlehem. The scribes and Pharisees say he'll be born in Bethlehem. The high priests and chief priests say He'll be born in Bethlehem. The population say He'll be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem, verse 1, chapter 2. They're orthodox literalists, perfect knowledge of Scripture, never touched in their souls by this reality that the child had been born and in Bethlehem. They're so in love with the darkness of their own damning religion of self-righteousness, they can't see the shepherd king when he arrives. So no sooner is Jesus born than, than people are divided into groups. There are the hated, the hatred and hostile groups. A group there, I should say, there is the hatred and hostility group. Those people who, like Herod, see this birth, this boy, this person 
as interfering in their lives, as being a threat to their ambition, destiny, control, power, position, place, will. Jesus interferes in their lives, interferes in their plans. They want nothing to do with Him. They want their own life, their own way, their own purposes, their own ambitions. They don't want anybody else lording it over them. The Jews even say that, we will not have this man to reign over us. They said that just before they executed Him at the cross. So there are those who are the the haters of Christ, those hostile to Him. And then there is that second group, the indifferent, the rest of the populace of Israel. It doesn't seem to make the slightest difference to them. They couldn't care less, so engrossed in their religion, temple, ritual, legal accusations um, against other people pushing themselves up higher on the righteous ladder by being accusatory of everybody who wasn't as good as they were. That's the kind of religion the Pharisees and the rabbis espoused. So self-righteous. He means nothing to them. They don't need a Savior. They don't need Him. And today we have the same thing. We have a world of people who are just indifferent, doesn't matter to them. There's a third group, and that's represented by the Magi, and those are the adoring worshipers. You have those who resent Christ and the threat that He brings to their own independence. You have those who couldn't care less because they're caught up in their own religion. And then you have the true worshipers. And I guess you have to ask yourself where you are because that's the ultimate question. So the arrival and the agitation results. Then Herod puts on an act, verse 7. Herod secretly called the Magi. The first meeting was public. It must have been a massive display of pomp and circumstance. Verse 8, He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. I don't want any haphazard effort at this. Search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Apparently they told him the time the sign appeared, so he said, go to Bethlehem, you do the work, Uh, you go, you find the child, come report to me. What was his intention? To worship? No. Go over to verse 16. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi who never came back and told him what he wanted to know, he became very enraged, sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Again, he would have known when the star appeared. It's certain months later. Any child two years or under, just to be sure, he slaughters. The hypocrisy of it, the act that he puts on, go and search carefully for the child. When you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. The Magi were going to be unwitting instruments of the killing of the Messiah diabolical cunning on Satan's part through Herod. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went their way. They have no reason to think he's lying to them. And the star which they had seen in the east, and I just point out, sometimes we get the notion that this star led them all the way. That's not what the text actually says. It appeared in the east. He was to be born certainly in Israel. He is God's King, the true God, the Old Testament God. They knew they were headed for Israel. They saw the star in the east announcing His birth. They don't see the star again until they get to Jerusalem. And when they leave Herod and go their way to look for the child, the star which they had seen in the east reappears and takes them right to Bethlehem five and a half miles away and right over the house where the child is. The Shekinah glory is shining. This is so wonderful. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Do you know that that verse is the reason there's so much joy in all the Christmas carols? Joy to the world the Lord has come. That's that's the sentiment of the Magi, not Israel, not the leaders of Israel, not the people of Jerusalem. 
That's those Gentile magi. This is true worship. They are true God-fearing Gentiles. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So they find the house where the, the three of them are living. They fell to the ground and worshiped Him. Again, they said, we come to worship Him. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and they worshiped Him. They were true worshipers. And again, I, I said this last week, I say it again, at the very beginning of the arrival of Christ, it was pretty clear to, to any reader of Scripture, He would be the Savior of the world because the world shows up even before the Jews crown Him King. They fell down to the ground and worshiped Him, and they brought gifts, interesting gifts. They opened uh, their treasures and presented to Him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I don't think these were kind of things that would just tokens. I, I think they lavished them on that little family. Um, gold for, for a long time, gold for a good part of their lives into the future. Frankincense, myrrh, these are fascinating gifts. They are gifts that have significance because they, they not only are a reality that was necessary in the ancient world, but they symbolize some things. Gold, by the way, is just precious. With gold, you're, you're wealthy. So when you think about Jesus uh, being poor, it's not likely that He was poor. The little family, when they went back to Nazareth, took gold with them. And also, Joseph was an employed man who ran some kind of a construction business. When it says that he became poor, it doesn't mean he became humanly poor. It means that he gave up his divine riches to take on the form of a servant as a human being. And then they brought also frankincense. Literally, that means pure incense. This is incense. And in the ancient world, there were certain trees with a kind of gum rosin on the surface, and they would make an incision in the tree, and out would come this, this white liquid. It was fragrant. It had a kind of uh, ointment benefit. And then there was myrrh. Myrrh was derived from a small tree in the Middle East used for perfuming. And it was always used in preparing a body for burial, and it was used in preparing the body of Jesus for burial. So they identified Him in magnificent ways with their gifts and enriched that little family, at least for the duration of their time. They weren't about to go back to Nazareth. They were really on their way to Egypt. It all ends in verse 12, at least this portion of it. For the Magi, they disappear from the scene, having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod. The Magi left for their own country by another way. God spoke to Joseph through a dream. He spoke to the Magi through a dream. He speaks to Joseph again in verse 13, "'Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, says, "'Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, remain there till I tell you Herod's going to search for the child to destroy him.'" God used dreams. In those days, for the means of His revelation, to, to do His will. So the Magi come on the scene, they disappear, but the story of Herod is not over. But the bottom line, just in pulling it all together, is to remind you of something I said a little while ago. There are only three groups that are clearly identified when Christ comes, those who resent Him, those who are indifferent to Him, and those who worship Him. You're in one of them. The first two are damning, and being indifferent is as damning as being hostile. Jesus put it this way, He that is not with me is against me. You want to be among those worshiping with the Magi. How important is it that we hold on to the truth about Christmas instead of uh, the imaginations? You can accept the pop view of Christmas 
uh, the baby in the manger, it's all kind of a sentimental scene and you have the shepherds there and they're all real clean and the, the whole scene is clean, the manger is clean. And have the wise men there with their three gifts and their crowns and all of that. From my standpoint, Christmas season every year is an opportunity to take people from that sort of pop idea of Christmas and move them to the full story. The most important part of Christmas is that God became a man. It's the incredible reality that the eternal God, the creator of everything in the universe, the consummator of all of his creation, the one who will create a new heaven and a new earth, the one who redeems sinners, the great God, all glorious God of heaven became a man. And I was talking to somebody the other day, they were going to work on a children's book and they were asking me the question, do you think we should give Jesus a face? Because, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to make an idol so we were thinking about, you know, if we in this children's book, we'll just show the back of his head or we'll kind of blur out his face. And I said, why would you want to do that? Well, the whole point of God becoming a man was so that you could see his face. He had a face. That's the, he, Moses couldn't see his face, but people who saw him when he was here could see his face. They could see his expressions. For children of all people, you don't want to make a mystery figure out of Jesus. So sure, we get it. We don't know exactly what his features are, but we can approximate what handsome Middle Eastern features might look like. But please, by all means, show his face because this is the face of the incarnate God and he wants you to look into his face. I think that's the marvelous reality of Christmas is the, the God of creation becomes a man, not for the purpose of showing off, but for the purpose of humbling himself to die in our place. So the shadow of the cross lies over the manger. But every detail of Christmas, when the shepherds come and why they come, and you do remember that they were the lowest people on the social ladder in Israel. And the very fact that God chose them to hear the angelic announcement and show up at the manger was saying something incredibly profound because the rabbis weren't there, the Pharisees weren't there, the Sadducees weren't there, the scribes weren't there, but the shepherds were there. What does that tell you about God humbling himself to come all the way down to sinners? And then later on, when Jesus is a little older and the wise men come, that shows you how the plan of salvation had already been announced. And you even have some Middle Eastern king makers, probably influenced by Daniel, who show up looking for the new king. Mm. And that, of course, activates Herod, who then fulfills the prophecy of slaughtering all the male children. I mean, the whole drama is just incredible. And we need to understand all the details because they all have a very important role to play. Even the slaughter of the innocents shows what Satan wanted to do with the Messiah. He wanted to kill him. And God protected him in that slaughter. So every little detail has tremendous significance. Pastor John, thank you for reminding us that Christmas isn't about what it means to us, it's about what it means to God. Exactly. Perfect for your own personal study or as a gift, the MacArthur Daily Bible can be ordered today by calling 888-57-GRACE or logging onto our website, gty.org. This is a great resource to help you start the new year rooted in the truth of God's word, available through grace to you.